One important characteristic of the evolution of technology on the basis of new combinations is that this evolution is characterized by discrete jumps. Sometimes things get continuously better and then suddenly there are these big jumps in it, like really disruptive innovations. So that's how you can think about it. For example, think about the first mobile phone, these kind of bricks as they call them. Over time they also became better, they became smaller and smaller and smaller, but they didn't change a lot qualitatively. So basically engineers explored the same technological space and scaled on it. In this case they made it smaller and smaller and smaller. Then the smartphone, the iPhone especially, came along and that was a symbiotic innovation. You combined uh, an iPod, a mobile phone, and uh, an internet uh, connection, and also a touchscreen and other things. And it was a different technological space to be explored afterwards. Now, there was this disruption in the evolutionary trajectory. And once we were in this new technological space, again, also the iPhone evolved, but then again, in a logic of continuous innovation. So the first generation iPhone, then came iPhone 3, four, five, six. And this, in this case, again, engineers explored the same technological space. They just improved on it. And now everybody is waiting for the next big thing. And again, a disruptive innovation will happen once this technological space uh, of the iPhone is completely explored and comes to an end. Then usually these disruptive technology, technological innovations do happen. So let's look at an example different than the mobile phone. For example, aircraft technology performance. First of all, if we analyze technology and the evolution of technology, we always have to ask about, well, what performance are we talking about? So that's basically the question of what is the typical need that we try to address? For example, an aircraft can carry a lot of people or an aircraft can be very fast. Now, there might be a trade-off between these two, but engineers have to then consider, well, what is the typical need that we have? Do we need to transport a lot of people or do we have to get from A to B very fast? So that's a very uh, important first thing that we have to consider. And let's look at these two trajectories, the seating capacity and the airspeed. And we can see if we analyze it, for example, the airspeed, that we have this uh, change between very quick periods of growth. For example, here we grew 9% uh, between 1930 and 1935. And then we have this long period from 1935 to 1955, where we grew actually very little. There was continuous innovation. And then again, around 1955, 1960, a period of disruptive, very quick growth. Well, the first period of growth was the propeller, the innovation of the propeller and the aircraft. And the second one was the innovation of the jet engine. So there have been disruptive changes, of course. Also on the basis of the propeller, there was some innovation going on, gradual innovation. For example, engineers exchanged the material that made the airplane lighter. And with that, also they could be faster. But the big changes happened at this disruptive events. Now, the seating capacity had a different innovation rhythm, not going one to one with the innovation of propeller and jet engine, but you can also see periods of more explosive growth and periods of slower growth. That has, again, if you would dig down, has to do with what kind of innovations happening, what kind of recombinations are being done to advance the solution to this typical need of transporting many people from A to B through the air. Now, the existence of disruptive innovations or continuous innovations has often to do with the availability of these building blocks that we use to look for new combinations. And a very interesting question in this regard is where these building blocks actually come from. Uh, sometimes we just find them per accident and sometimes we can really look for them, for example, through research and development. So actively investing also in research and development, giving people the resources to look for building blocks by recombining on a low level can have a big effect. 
And there's actually a lot of confusion out there, especially in the general public, of where these fundamental building blocks come from. For example, you heard Steve Jobs and the iPhone. Where do you think the fundamental building blocks come from that Steve Jobs recombined in order to create the innovation that he called iPhone? Who created these building blocks?